how bad, how bad is sin? How bad is it? Do you wonder? Saying, uh huh. What are we back? Oh, send the Linda. Can you do anything worse to people than what Hitler did to them? You know, how bad is it? All of this corruption that Stan talks about in the prayer, those are the visible manifestations of something massive, a predator, a parasite that feeds corrupts, takes babies and turns them into Hitlers and Stalins and on and on and on. That's the sinfulness of sin. And people who live for it, live in it, as the human family, as a human family, have chosen to do. Not you, not me, not him, not them, us as a single family feeding it to one another, infecting one another with it. When the scriptures speak about sinful flesh, sinful humanity, Romans 8 verse 3, it isn't speaking about individuals here and there. But sin is, it, it's beyond, it's beyond our telling. Yes, but, but, but what's God's response to it? What's God's response to it? Nobody knows how bad it is except God who manifested himself in Christ. We say we know how bad it is, and we've got a good idea about it. Every now and again, the things we do or think or said or in the past or whatever has disgusted us. Yeah? So we know how bad it is. He knows. He and he alone knows how bad it is. <clears throat> I'm wanting to ask, what, what is his uh, response to it? What? See, if this were a Bible class and things opened up, you'd be telling me and uh, we'd be talking about it. But what? What was his response to it? The thing more brutal, more cruel, more heartless, more um, uh, predatorial, and uh, all of that. What, what was his response to it? He wanted to forgive it. What kind of God is it who looks at who we are on Mars? and wants to forgive us. Well, we're all sinners and na da 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 and we're worthy of condemning. Okay, yeah, okay. Worthy of condemning. And so that's what he did, him being holy, yeah? Him being holy beyond imagining, yes? So he sent Christ to Damas, that's what happened. Is it? You know the scriptures that say that twice in Second Corinthians five, God in Christ, in Christ, was redeeming, redeeming the world. And he says it again, redeeming the world in Christ, not laying to their account their sins. You say. I say, we say, sin is absolutely unmentionably wicked. And we're not denying that, even though we know, yeah, okay, well, we know sin is bad, but we don't know really how bad it is. He knows how bad it is. He knows without limit how bad it is. And what's his response to it? He wants to forgive it. So what then does that mean? Not only that God is bigger than sin, of course, God's bigger than everything. But he wants to forgive the sin and deals with it. 
whatever that means, deals with it. He deals with it. And in the process of dealing with it, he wants to forgive it. So while sin is all that we say it is, the love of God, the love of God is greater than sin at its worst. Sin, unimaginably evil. God, unimaginably loving. Yes? You know the only reason, the only reason that God forgives anybody? The only reason God forgives someone who says, please, forgive me. Do you know the only reason he wants to forgive them and draws them in by the gospel and all the ways he does it to where we say, oh, sick of my sin. I'm sick of me and my sinfulness. I want forgiven. Do you know the only reason he wants to forgive us? The only, the single solitary reason is because he loves us. He has no other motive. He has no other motive. If I forgive them, I can work with them and, you know, I can make them better and, and deliver them. All of that's true. But that is also the expression of God who, for no other reason, wants to forgive us, wants to shape us, wants to release us from not only the penalty, but the power of it. He's a lover. J. H. Jowett said about a century and a half ago, listen, listen, God loves you more than you love your darling sin. The sin that brings you most pleasure, the thing that you can hardly wait, it's supposing we're all addicted to this, no matter what it is, paint the worst picture of it. Your darling sin. God sees it, knows what it is, calls it what it is, and still wants to forgive it. What kind of a God is it that you worship? Well, he, he forgives me when I'm repentant. Why does he want to forgive you at all? And my repentance, your repentance, their repentance. How did that come about? The goodness of God, Romans 2, verse 3. The goodness of God leads to repentance. The goodness of God leads him to give us repentance. 2 Timothy 2, verse 25. Why? Why are we okay with God? Because we don't sin as much as we used to. We don't like our sin as much as we used to. That's not the bottom line. That's his work in us where that is the case. But why does he bother working? Why does he bother reaching? Why does he send his son? Why does he do any of that for no other reason than He's a lover. When John says God is love, and if you don't love, you don't know God. God is love. He doesn't mean that God's an abstraction. He means if you dug deep into God's chest and hoped around and checked everything, if you had a tunnel microscope and checked it out every cell, if he had cells, if you checked them out, you'd find nothing. But a lover... I cannot bear the doctrine of penal substitution. It is sick doctrine that God has to punish sin out of existence before he can forgive. 
He has to take a young man at most 30 something years in this phase. More devoted to God than anybody could ever imagine. Who does only what he himself said. I do only the things that please him. And in order to forgive us, he punishes that sinless, warm, righteous, loving young man. He punishes him. That's not true. God cannot forgive you unless he punishes somebody to the nth. What? What kind of nonsense is this? It isn't just nonsense. We inherit it, it from fellows like Augustine of Hippo way back in the fifth century where it all developed up, and then the Catholic and the Protestant battles in the 16th century at the most. We, why did Jesus have to die? You know why he had to die? Because he loved us and come into a world, and that's what happens to you when you come into a world standing for God and standing for people out of love. The world comes to hate you. Hmm. God didn't punish Jesus. Did he bear our sin? Well, of course, scriptures say it repeatedly, that he bore our sins in his body up onto the tree, 1 Peter 2, 24, and a number of other texts that you're acquainted with. But what does it mean that he bore our sins? It does not mean it does not mean he took our sins, transformed, transferred them off us onto Christ and punished Jesus. That is drivel. It's not only drivel, it is a perversion of the character of God. For God so loved us that he punished Jesus Christ so he could stop hating us. This is satanic stuff. Why? Why does God forgive you? Me? He wants to. Why does he want to? Because he is a lover and made you. Dear God, he loves us. Why do you want to forgive sometimes? You've been really badly hurt, betrayed, whatever it is. And there they go, walking off, slandering your name, but you've been friends for years, and they walked off. And now they're doing you injury. You ever had that happen? I suspect you have, to one degree or another. And yet what? You wanted the friendship back someone you felt the loss of and you wanted to forgive them you knew what they were doing and well, what they were doing you said that's wrong that's terrible that's all of that and uh, but you say but i don't want that to be happening i don't want the sin and the slander that you're doing to stand between you and me i don't want that i want us to be friends i want I want you to love me because I love you. Yeah. There is no other motive for God wanting to forgive us. So here comes Christ. He comes into a world that's called sinful flesh. And what happens? He suffers. And why does he suffer? Because he came to deal with our sin. He came to tell us. What did he come to tell us? God gave his son that they that believe in him might not perish, but have everlasting life because, 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 because God did, did not send his son to condemn the world. He sent the Son to show his love of the world. 
And who did he die for? Who did he suffer for? Who did he die for? Who did he take the hurt that comes to people who love people who are slanderous and this, that, and the other? When you enter a world like that, and you love God and the world hates God, you suffer the consequences just come into the world. And why does he come into the world? And who does he die for? First John 2, 2. And his blood is the propitiation sacrifice. Um, his blood's a propitiation, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. Can we have salvation without the death of Christ? Absolutely not. This is not a question. It's not a question that Christ come in and is he suffering and does he die because it's indispensable that he do all of that. Not just die, live, sinlessly live and sinlessly live for us. And sinlessly die for us and sinlessly rise for us. 425 of Romans. He was delivered up for our trespasses and he was resurrected for our justification. The cross alone did not take care of the whole story about sin. The whole story about the dealing with sin is when you experience, when I, by the grace of God, we or anyone by the grace of God experiences full salvation, it's when we are resurrected and glorious, even as he. Did God punish Jesus? No. Were sins transferred, our sins transferred unto him so that he could be punished with the sin that we would, uh, with the punishment that we would have gotten? It's nonsense. Had, had he not come and redeemed us, how, if he had not come to save us, what would have happened to us? We would have suffered eternal punishment, loss, eternal loss. We would, that would have been what was our due. And was he punished with the punishment that was going to come on us? And wasn't he eternally lost? Oh, no, he wasn't eternally lost. Then did he suffer? Did he suffer what it is that we would have? And we would have lost forever. No going back. We would have perished, never seen the life eternal and everlasting that God wanted for us. That's what would have happened to us. We would have perished. That would have been it. And we wouldn't have felt that we're missing the life, but we would have missed it. And he didn't want us to miss it. I want you to live with me. Enjoy ceaselessly my companions. All of that he wanted for us. And that's completed. That's completed when we are gloriously resurrected and live forever with him. Here's the story. Here's the story. Christ was not punished by God. Was he put to pain and grief? Yeah. That isn't punishment. He himself, he ran to it. He didn't want to stay from it. He said, you know why the Father loves me? Because I lay down my life. And Hebrews 2, 5 and following, particularly 10 and following, but 5 and following, it behooved God. It looked 
good on him. It, it suited who he wants in bringing many sons and daughters to glory to bring the Savior through suffering. And you who belong to Christ, when you image Christ in this life of yours, the church in its life, it images him by suffering and then comes glory. You know why you get hurt in the world? You know why you endure all this stuff, the consequences of evil? You know why? Because he did. He comes into a world sinless, had no ill feeling for anybody, meant to say to us and to the world, and this is how it's dealt with. You know how you deal with the sin of someone who has betrayed you. Do you know what? Do you know it deals with the sin so that it no longer separates you and your heart from them? You love them. Do you know what beats sin? The love of God. That and that alone. Punishment. Punishing of Jesus Christ. The Hebrew writer says he offered himself, he offered himself with that spot. If you're going to transfer sin, it's not only actions you transfer. It's attitude, disposition. Sin is not just called um, anomia, lawlessness. It's not just deeds. It's called uncleanness. Sin is uncleanness. It's impurity. And if we're going to transfer that, our sins, we transfer it over onto Jesus. That's not what happens. God doesn't need to punish sin out of it. He loves it out. As you trying to get this friend back who's betrayed you, this husband, this wife, this parent, this child who has betrayed you. You don't punish anyone for it. You certainly don't go to some innocent person and punish them in order to forgive the one who's sinning against you. It's not what you do. If indeed you are the lover of this one who has been traitorous. Do you know what kills the sin as a destructive element? Your love for them, your continuing to pursue them. That's, that's God. There is no other motive. None. There is no other motive. Do you know what he do you know what he writes across you? You, you, you who are sitting here this minute, we who are here and then scattered all over the world. Do you know what he says of you who are his because you trust him? And I've given your life and whatever it is I can give you, Lord, you can have it. Do you, know, do you know what he writes across you again and again? These are not of the world. You don't belong to the world. Well, you feel like you do. It don't matter what you feel. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We don't walk by sight, appearance. He could easily have said, and he says it in other ways and other places, um, we don't walk by feelings. I don't care who you think you are. I know what Jesus says you are. I don't care what the church tells you you are. I mean, aspects of it. I know, and you know, what the Lord has said about you. You know what he said about you? Do you know what he looks at you and, and says about you? The world, not the people and all, not the sticks and stones, the trees and the rivers, the world, this organized evil. The world, John 15, the world hates you. If you were of the world, if you were still in that structure, that evil structure, if you were still in that world, I'm nearly done. Okay, and you're doing well. If you were still in that evil structure, 
If you were of the world, he says in John 15, the world would love you as its own, but you're not in the world. And remember this, if it hates you, it first hated me. You know who you are. Do you really believe that you're not of this world? Well, my, my skin and my bones and all my sore back and all these things and, and the disappointment, the job, they all say, uh, you know, I'm of the world. No, no, no. You're in the world. Jesus said in John 17 to the Father, they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, I'm not wanting you, Father, to take them out of the world. To live in the world is to live in the flesh and you've got all the problems. But while you're living here, living in the world, you don't belong to it. Jesus never did, but he was in it in the middle of it doing all of that. Do you know why you're in the world right now, this world? Do you know why you're in it? <laughs> do you know? Of course you do. I'm like to think about it. But you know, do you know why you're in it? He wants you in it. Father, I don't want you to take them out of the world. And then he says, as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. Do you know why you're here? In the middle of all the frustration, in the middle of all the <laughs> confusion, in the middle of all the questions and all of that. You know why you're here? He wants you here. And what you're doing when you continue to trust in God, what you're doing when you continue to trust in God, you say to yourself, he says, I, I, I've been wicked and I, I'm, I'm still wrestling with the, the, the ulcers and that, but, but I'm done with that. I'm done with it. I, I won't whitewash it. I will not whitewash it. I don't want anybody else to whitewash it. I still have the ulcers. Look, I see that. And I know I'm a sinner, but I'll tell you, I'm done with it. I will not live that way anymore. When I fall down, I fall down that I might get up again. That's how it is with me. And how did that happen? God sent a son to tell us, you're bad. This is a sad, bad world. But I love you. And I, <laughs> I want you to be friends with me, servants of mine, joyful and all of that. And that's what Christ was bearing, all the agony, all the sorrow, all the hurt, all the beatings, all of that, but, but more than the physical anything. He sits in a mountain sobbing, and what's he sobbing over? He said, if you only knew, Luke 19, if you only knew the hour of your visitation, you know what's going to happen? And then in Matthew 23, closing line, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you away a hand in danger, gathers her chickens under her wings, and you wouldn't have it. Have you any idea how I feel about you, he says? That's who you are, beloved of God, and he needs no other motive. None. We punish ourselves in our alienation. We hurt one another in our corrupted states. But he wanted none of that. I, I, I get no pleasure in any of that, he says three times in Ezekiel. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to stay away from me. And we say to him, why is that? And he he said, because I feel so deeply about you, and I want you. And we say, yeah, but, but, but in order to love us like that, first you have to punish Jesus. Punish Jesus, he'd say. 
I never leave him, never. As he himself said, for I do, said to the disciples, you're going to run off and leave me alone, but I am not alone. For my father is always with me because I do always the things that please me. And when he offers himself on the cross, he's a high priest for pity's sake. And he's a spotless one who is sacrificing his life. Yeah. And he does all of that and the dying process by the spirit of holiness, we're told. He was never cut off. Yeah, but there are texts there about forsaken. One of these days we'll have as a Bible study one night. Believe this first. First, 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 believe this. God needs no other motive to forgive you than he is who he is. He's a lover. And he's still a lover when Christ is on the cross saying what he says. One of these days we'll take it up with that, okay? God enabling us. And if you can take any more of this. Holy Father, whatever else is confusing, surely by now, wouldn't you think, Father, wouldn't you think that we now really have it? Hey, but, but, Father, what is that? Uh, wouldn't, 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 wouldn't you think that we would already know that you love us beyond words? There are not enough words to tell it. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think we have it? Help us. Help us to get it. Because if we know you deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, we will be changed more and more and more. And we will then get some sense of the love that you have that passes understanding. That we can't get the north, south, east, and west of it. It is too big. And we can then imagine it. And our imagination won't be big enough. Would you help us to believe that? And then, then by and by, feel it. We're glad that you leave us in the world to be the light and the salt and to forgive awful wrongs committed against us to manifest the image of the Lord Jesus Christ in our suffering. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, everybody, you know what to do. Unmute.